I want to start with saying um, thank you to all of our friends who came here from overseas. I've been getting an insane amount of messages in the last 24 hours. Is it safe to come to Malaysia? Is it dangerous? Are people going to protest? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I just want to tell everyone that Malaysia is the most progressive for democratic country that you'll ever find as long as you read the Malaysian newspapers. So <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for making it here. So what I wanted to start with is um, I wanted to do something different. I was given the title of Digital Disruption, and I thought, you know what? It's such a kind of average, boring, typical kind of topic. So what I thought I would do is I want to do a little game with everyone here. You guys up for a game? Yeah? I wanted to use crowdsourcing to come up with a better title for my presentation. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to throw out a title. If you guys like it, say, yeah. If you like it more, say, yeah. And the title that has the loudest, yeah, is the presentation that I'll go with today. Where I got this idea is, I guess, if you guys have seen websites like BuzzFeed and Says, you know they have these really catchy headlines like, seven things about Kim Kardashian's body you never knew before. And it makes you click. And then you realize the article has nothing to do with Kim Kardashian. So here we go. We're going to try with digital disruption in ASEAN. <laughs> Wait, am, I, am I at the right, the right room? OK. OK, we'll try. Seven things you must know about digital disruption in ASEAN. Seven things you must know about Kim Kardashian's body. Yeah. Okay. We'll get her as the keynote next year instead. Seven things you must know about digital disruption in ASEAN. That will surprise you. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Let's see, let's see if this one works. Seven things you must know about digital disruption in ASEAN. That will surprise you and blow your mind. Okay, let's get our minds blown. Number one, you know, disruption is this buzzword that everyone says, oh, disruption, this, disruption, that, newspapers being disrupted, travel agents being disrupted, car businesses being disrupted. Well, what I wanted to share with you is that disruption is not new. Disruption is not a buzzword. It's not something of the last five years. Disruption actually is what mankind does. Disruption is what mankind has been doing for the last 10,000 years. I don't know if anyone's wondered, if you think about all the great empires that we studied in school, none of them are around today. The Romans, the Greeks, the Mayans, the Aztecs, etc., etc. Every great empire always comes to its end. Disruption is as old as human civilization. When we look at companies, we realize that companies unfortunately, don't last forever as well. The Dow Jones Industrial Index, which is a summary of the biggest, most powerful, most richest uh, companies listed on the American Stock Exchanges, was formed over 100 years ago. And what they did is they took the 12 biggest companies in America. And this is when America came out of the Industrial Revolution as the biggest superpower in the world. They took the 12 biggest companies, and said, let's make an index of these companies, and that was the Dow Jones Index. Only one of those 12 companies is still alive today. So it doesn't make you wonder, what happened to the other 11 companies that were big, mighty, powerful, rich, successful? They all got disrupted. Fact number two. Disruption is when small fish get together and eat the big fish, which is... A little bit ironic because we're always taught the rules of the jungle, the rules of the sea, is that big fish eat small fish. But when the small fish get together and attack and nibble and bite at the big fish, bit by bit by bit, the small fish take the big fish down. So what we have in the world today is that <clears throat> we have small fish, we have big fish. Small fish is all of the internet companies, all the internet companies out there trying to make a difference, trying to make things better, trying to make things faster. 
And then we have all the non-internet companies, old, boring, probably been around for decades. Small fish, big fish. Let's do a quick survey. How many people here are from the small fish? Say yeah. 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 How many people here are from the big fish? The, oh, <laughs> Don't be scared. We're not going to eat you <laughs> yet. How many people here are from the big fish? That'll be more than five. Anyway, so... I guess the point that we're trying to make is that <clears throat> small fish are the future of disruption. The small companies, the nimble, the hungry, don't have many resources but have the proactiveness, the creativity. The small fish are the ones that eventually, over time, disrupt the big fish. <clears throat> Back number three. And this is something that not many people realize, that disruption is actually a zero-sum game. It's no different than Game of Thrones. You either win or you die. There really is no in-between. And the interesting thing about disruption is that when the small fish create value, they build a product that people want, users migrate, they create value, companies are worth more. Someone on the other side of the spectrum loses value. So when value is created, value is lost. And in the end, it kind of nets out. <clears throat> so when you read about Apple worth what, five, six, seven hundred billion, the biggest company ever in the history of mankind. That means that there are other companies out there that lost value. Nokia, Ericsson, et cetera, Motorola, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> I'll give you guys an interesting analogy. I don't know if anyone in this room, well, if you're from the small fish world, you're probably under 30, 35 years old. You probably never even used the Yellow Pages. You probably used Google. In 1999, the total value of all of the Yellow Pages companies in the world was 60 billion US dollars. When Google first launched in 1999, Google was probably worth about 100 million dollars. The total value within seven years of all of the Yellow Pages companies in the world had gone from 60 billion to less than 1 billion. This is what happened to this big fish. 60 billion US dollars in enterprise value completely disrupted. What was Google's market cap when they IPO'd in 2006? Oddly enough, exactly 60 billion. See what I mean? Someone gained, somebody lost. If we look closer to Malaysia, our two favorite Malaysian newspapers, <clears throat> I tried to choose the most appropriate covers possible. So the star says, bloggers beware. It really should be the star that should, be beware, that should beware. And in the New Straits Times, best is yet to come. So here we go, 1999, the two most popular English newspapers in Malaysia were collectively worth about US $1.5 billion. Now, a number of people here are from the classifieds industry and will realize that if you are a newspaper company, anywhere from 40 to 80% of your profits comes from the classifieds doesn't come from the other parts of the newspaper. It comes from the jobs, the property, and the car ads. So what happened in 1999? A website called Job Street launched. A website called iProperty wasn't even founded yet. A website called Carlist wasn't even founded yet. So collectively, these three small fish, two of them weren't even alive yet. Today, the two newspapers collectively would be worth under US 500 million. That's one billion US. At today's exchange rate, that's probably 4.1 or 4.2 billion ringgit, completely disrupted. Here's the interesting thing. If you add up the enterprise value of Job Street, iProperty, Carlist, and other online classified players in this space, it comes to about US 1.5 billion. So back to the point, disruption is a zero-sum game. Someone gains, somebody loses. Let's look at America. In 2006, the total value of every publicly listed internet company in America was 400 billion US. So companies like Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook, 400 billion US. By 2015, this number had become 1.7 trillion. 
So what you see is 1.3 trillion in value had been created. So if disruption truly is a zero-sum game, that means companies out there collectively lost 1.3 trillion in value. That seems like a lot. 1.3 trillion in value in the valuations of companies just disappears over a nine-year period. Let's see if it plays out. In 2006, the value of every publicly listed company in America was 18.6 trillion. Do you want to know what it was in 2015? Does anyone want to guess? It was the same. So that means over nine years, the value of every, of all the companies in America stayed the same. Yet, Google tripled in value. Facebook was created and exploded. Apple became the biggest company in the history of mankind. So what you see is that on the other side of the spectrum <clears throat> is a graveyard of all of the big fish companies that have been disrupted and are continuously every day losing value more and more and more. Here's another interesting stat. In 2006, small fish were 2.5% of total US company value. Doesn't seem like a lot, right? It's like, who cares, 2.5%. Why bother? 2014, 9% of US company value was attributed to internet companies. 2.5% to 9%. What gets really scary is that for the last three years, the rate at which internet companies disrupt non-internet companies was at 2.5% per annum. If you continue at this rate, that means in 36 years, non-internet companies will not exist. I'm going to say that again. That means in 36 years, non-internet companies will not exist at all. You will see a complete disruption of all non-internet companies. Okay, you guys wanted your mind to be blown. I'm going to blow your mind with one more stat. <clears throat> Thanks. To, so if you know anything about physics or Moore's law, you'll know that acceleration continues. You know that if you push a ball down a hill, it gets faster and faster and faster. So what we saw, when we saw the 2.5% go to 9%, for the first couple of years, the disruption was at 1% a year. The last three years, the disruption has been at 2.5% a year. If we assume that the disruption continues, and moves to 5% a year and stabilizes at that number, that means in 15 to 20 years from now, all non-digital companies will be completely destroyed. I hope that was more interesting than Kim Kardashian's body. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so 15 to 20 years complete this world. So you sit there and you go, how can this happen? Like, so let's take a company like Honda, one of the most successful car companies in the world. Will Honda exist in 15 to 20 years? Yeah, why not? Everybody buys cars, everyone needs a Honda. Well, you know what? Not necessarily. If you now study the latest stats of car sharing apps, things like Grab Taxi, things like Uber, what they're starting to show is that not only are people using it to book a car to get around, it's gone way beyond that. People are now not buying cars and relying purely on car sharing services. Uber's most advanced market and first market was San Francisco. The total size of the San Francisco taxi market was about $100 million a year. Uber's revenue in San Francisco is about $500 million a year. So not only has it disrupted taxi booking, it's gone way beyond by 5X, which means that people in San Francisco are no longer buying new cars, they're deciding to share cars. So which means then, if this trend continues in every other city in the world, new car sales actually start to go down. If you assume that new car sales go down by 20% over the next five to 10 years, out of the 37 car manufacturers that we have in the world today, half of them will probably go bust. So back to this point, it is very likely, and you can see that in the future, we will have a world where non-internet companies will be completely disrupted. Not partly disrupted, completely disrupted. I like to call it the walking dead. So you're not really 
You're not dead, but you're not really alive. You're kind of in this middle state. And this is what will happen. If you work for a big fish company today, chances are your business will become the walking dead in the next 15 to 20 years. So I think we'd all like to have a moment of silence to all of, to the six big fish who admitted that they worked for a big fish company. We love you, may you rest in peace. Um, <clears throat> so disruption, how much disruption does your business or does your sector take? Well, you know what? It's directly related to how many users use your service. It actually is directly related. Let's do a show of hands. How many people have used Uber or Grab Taxi in the last six months? Pretty much everyone. How many people have used Airbnb in the last six months? Okay, about half. How many people have used Tinder? This is purely for academic research, by the way. How many people have used Tinder in the last six months? Don't lie. Come on, we're, we're meant to change the world here. Let's not lie. Well, this, this gentleman's married. I hope it was for research purpose. Okay. Maybe I'll ask it another way. How many people have just kind of looked at the app to see what it is, but not actually used it? Okay, okay, okay. So what's interesting is you look at the valuations of, this com of these companies, they are pretty much directly in sync with the number of people raising their hands. Pretty much everybody raised their hand for Uber Grab Taxi. Then half the room dropped their hands for Airbnb. And then, you know, we had a small fraction who admitted to using Tinder. I remember your faces. So, <laughs> so disruption is directly related to how many people use your service. So if you're going to get there and disrupt, if you aim to build Malaysia's biggest customized on-demand cupcake service, not going to disrupt a lot of people. <clears throat> Number six, right for disruption. So if you're looking to be in a disruptive space, you're looking to invest in the disruptive space, and we believe that over the next 15 to 20 years, internet companies will completely disrupt and annihilate non-internet companies, you look at, well, what sectors have not been disrupted yet, or what sectors have been disrupted? So in the last 15 years, retail has been completely disrupted. Amazon and Sogo. Um, Lazada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Media has been completely disrupted. I mean, when is the last time anyone in this room looked at the yellow pages or anyone in this room read a newspaper? But if you look at the sectors that have not been disrupted yet, healthcare, education, finance, the whole sharing economy is only starting to get significant momentum. So these are sectors where most people believe are ripe for massive, massive, massive disruption. Lastly, point number seven is the smartphone revolution. So how many people used your mobile phone at some point today? Hope, hopefully not for Tinder. Um, <clears throat> how many people used your mobile phone today to actually make a phone call? So the point being that this amazing device that we all have in our pocket is not really a phone with other features. It's really a supercomputer that also makes phone calls. And when you start to think about it that, this way, it is the greatest opportunity for anyone to build a disruptive business because within seconds, anyone in this room can push something onto the internet that has the potential to be seen by billions and billions and billions of people. If we look back at Airbnb, uh, sorry, if you look back at Uber or Grab Taxi, I don't even think you can use those services on a desktop. I don't even think they work. You have to use it on a phone. And these are $40 billion in enterprise value solely coming from the phone. The last point that I want to close with is something that gets me really, really excited. <clears throat> the number of smartphones in Southeast Asia is now 220 million people. The number of smartphones being used in America is 200 million. The number of smartphones being used in the EU is 170 million. So I'll tell you why this is interesting. is because for the first time ever, the total addressable market in Southeast Asia for building a disruptive business is bigger 
than America. And why that's important, because for someone who's been in the small fish world for the last 15 years, whenever you'd talk to investors and say, hey, I want to build the ABC of something that you've seen in America, or I want to build the XYZ of something you've seen in Europe, people would always think, well, yeah, your business is always going to be, well, if the American guy is worth $5 billion, maybe you'll be worth $100 million. If the American guy is worth $10 billion, maybe one day, if everything goes well, your company will create a billion in value. Whereas the interesting thing is that for the first time ever in history, because our markets are bigger, we now have this beautiful opportunity on our hands where companies that we create, participate, or invest in can become bigger than the American companies that you read about on TechCrunch and other sites like that. So if you think about a world, <clears throat> my, my crazy dream, my crazy vision is that someone in this room we part of a disruptive business in Southeast Asia that builds a business bigger than the same disruptive business in America. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a beautiful time. Thank you.